I sometimes think about the cross and shut my eyes and try to see the cruel nails, the crown of thorns, and Jesus crucified for me. But even could I see him die, I would but see a little part of that great love which, like a fire, is always burning in his heart. You are valuable to God. Don't ever minimize your individuality. The very word individual means you cannot be divided up. You are unique and a composite fashioned in the image of God for a particular purpose. Creation. But you move from creation, an intrinsic worth and reflective splendor. You move to the incarnation that Jesus is that eke homo, he reflects for you and me what it actually meant to be human. You will never see another life so pristine, so pure. I wrote a book called The Lotus and the Cross, an imaginary conversation between Jesus and Buddha. And I interviewed Buddhist monks and priests from many parts of the world. And I forget how many times I asked the question, who do you think is that quintessential expression of what life is intended to be like is lived. Many of the Buddhist philosophers and priests themselves would say, Jesus Christ. That's why even Mahatma Gandhi, who was a devout Hindu, made the comment once, he said, my problem with Christianity is that I like their Christ, but I don't like their Christian. Because of all that he'd seen wrong, young people, Nobody can shine the light brighter in our times than people like you. And when we talk about the incarnation, pour your mind into the scriptures to study the person of Jesus so that you will reflect that splendor. Two things about the incarnation, the absoluteness of the moral law and the supremacy of love. The absoluteness of the moral law and the supremacy of love. What does that mean? The moral law has boundaries. There is no such thing as free love. Free love is a contradiction in two words. Love was never intended to be free. So we see the supremacy, the absoluteness of the moral law and the supremacy of love. A few days ago, I was speaking in Los Angeles, officiating at a wedding of a young man I've known from when he was a little boy. You know, it's very hard to stand in front of a young couple making those vows. It's very hard to look at a beautiful bride and not have the tears fill your eyes because some dad is trusting his precious daughter into the hands of a man who in many ways is still a stranger. And so I said to them, do you know what your vows actually mean. Do you know what those vows mean? And I looked at the young groom and I said, Joe, she is paying you the highest compliment in taking you at your word. She's paying you the highest compliment of taking you at your word because there's, an, there's a binding of the law and there's a supremacy of love. The Bible uses four words for love. Agape, storge, phileo, Eros, agape, God's love, storge, protective love, phileo, friendship love, eros, romantic love. Do you know that in Christian consummate marriages, it is only a Christian marriage there in every way that brings the four of these together in consummate expression. God's love, friendship love, protective love, and the love of Eros in the consummate cleaving of one body to another, representing the one soul blending with the other. Mathematics may say one plus one is two. Marriage says one plus one is either a million or just one. You found your love and it's worth a million, but in reality, you do not die to your distinctiveness, but you do die to your selfishness. And so to you young men and women, I want to say this to you. The world has lost the meaning of what it really intend for the word love to communicate. We think it boils down to songs. We think it boils down to phrases and romantic terminology. Let me say something to you. 
Some months ago, I was speaking at a conference and I was talking in some other context and I said, marriage is really commitment, you know. And a woman about my vintage came to me and said, I disagree with you. I don't believe it's merely commitment. I said, what do you mean? She said, at its heart, it is not mere commitment, it is sacrifice. I have to say to you, I was rattled a bit. I even discussed it with her. I said, well, you know, commitment involves walking in one will and so on. She says, no, Ravi, what I mean is what I'm saying to you. It is sacrifice. And so I say to you, when we are talking about the supremacy of love, we are talking about the incarnation. What language shall I borrow to thank you, dearest friend, for this thy dying sorrow, thy pity without end? Oh, make me thine forever, and should I fainting be, Lord, let me never, never outlive my love for thee. On one occasion, speaking to the United Nations prayer breakfast, they asked me to speak on absolutes, a tough subject with many cultures in front of you, 18 minutes or so in which to do it and offend nobody. So I said, what are absolutes? We're looking for boundaries, points of reference. I said, there are four absolutes we look for, evil, justice, love, and forgiveness. Defining evil, defining justice, defining love, and knowing when we've blown it to be forgiven. I said, think, they're sitting, listening very carefully. What's this got to do with the gospel? Evil, justice, love, and forgiveness. I just want to be kind to everybody. Five minutes left. I said, I want to ask you a question. Where on earth did four of these converge at one moment in history? And they were just staring at me. I said, may I take you to a hill called Calvary? where the evil in the heart of man was shown, where the love of God was displayed, where God honors his own law in justice and brings grace to forgive you and me. On the hill of Calvary, the four absolutes absolutely came together. And may I say to you, there was a lineup of those ambassadors to shake hands. One man from an atheistic country that I won't name, shook my hand and said, Mr. Zacharias, I don't like being here. I come from an atheistic country and my family is not here with me. I'm a very lonely man. Every day I ask myself the question, why am I here? Why am I here? He said, today I found the answer. I came here to find God. I came here to find God. You may not know why you're here this afternoon or this weekend. You may be here with a friend. You may be here out of curiosity. You may be here that you really like some particular presenter or speaker or whatever. Do you know you possibly are here to make an appointment with God? Because he has an appointment with you. And so we have creation, incarnation, thirdly and quickly, transformation. God offers to change your heart and allow you to be the full measure of who you really were meant to be. The Bible says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself for no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has exalted him and given to him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Ecce homo. Ecce homo. See the man who is willing to transform you. I just wrote an article called uh, Hindsight, Eyesight, and uh, Insight coming into 2020. I give an illustration of a 12-year-old boy a few days ago who was born colorblind. Couldn't see colors. One day in the classroom recently, they had a surprise for him. They had a device and a pair of glasses that he could put on his eyes so that he could see colors for the first time and a riot of colors was placed in front of him. 
He's got these glasses on, this little kid. And he's looking and looking and looking. And he covers his eyes and bursts into tears for the first time he'd seen the world of color. The hymn writer says, heaven above is softer blue. Earth around is sweeter green. Something lives in every hue. Christless eyes have never seen. Birds with gladder songs or flow. Stars with deeper beauty shine. Since I know, as now I know, I am his and he is mine. My brother is a serious diabetic. He's a surgeon in Toronto. Two weeks ago, they did a surgery on him and he wrote to the family, I cannot tell you what it means to see colors again. I cannot tell you what it means to see colors again. So a brilliant surgeon, had to give it up because of his failing eyesight and went into pain management because the emotional toll of pain. The sight is back, the colors are back, he's driving again. He said, I cannot tell you what it means to have sight of colors again. Transformation. The Bible calls it new birth and the clock is ticking away so I'll have to end here. Creation, incarnation, transformation, and consummation. What does consummation mean? Worship. You are consumed in the worship of the living God. Let me just put it to you in these words as I close. You see, universities try to answer a question, what does it mean to find unity in diversity? That's why universities were created, to find unity in diversity. But they don't have unity in diversity. Do you know why? Because you will never find unity in diversity on the outside until you have unity in diversity on the inside. And that comes from worship, which Archbishop William Temple says is the submission of all of our nature to God. It's the quickening of conscience by His holiness nourishment of mind by his truth, purifying of imagination by his beauty, opening of the heart to his love, and submission of will to his purpose. All this gathered up together is the greatest expression of which you are capable. God brings you that total consummate fulfillment by bringing together all of your proclivities and binding it together in the sacredness of your expression to God. That's why we sing. That's why we celebrate. That's why we listen to the word. That's why we give. That's why we speak. That's why we are here from so many different nations, all here for the same message. Eke homo, behold the man, the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us full of grace and truth. What does it mean to be human? You go from creation to the incarnation, to transformation, to consummation. Is there any other worldview that gives you this kind of an answer except in the word becoming flesh and dwelling amongst us full of grace and truth? His name is Jesus. He brings to you the real meaning of what it means to be human. May I please close in prayer? Heavenly Father, how beautiful the sight of thee must be, thy endless wisdom, boundless love, and awesome purity. One day we will stand before you, and Lord, I have absolutely no doubt will be silent because everything about you will transcend anything we could say. Thank you for this wonderful gathering of people. Thank you that they are here for they are the real heroes of this gathering, not those of us who are speaking. We're here because we've been given this privileged position. They are here, Lord, because they want to hear from you. 
Bless them. If anyone is running in the opposite direction, stop with your loving hands and turn them around. I thank you for the team and passion that has worked so hard to bring this about. And now as we enter this new year, maybe not just look behind, but maybe look ahead and may these young men and women help change the world. It is a dark, dark place, but yours is a bright, bright light. Let them understand what it means to be human, why you are mindful of us, why you visited us, why you will return for us, and why you transform us with your power. Let your presence go with us as we leave. And may we know you are side by side, deep within, walking ahead and picking us up if we should ever stumble. Let your benediction rest upon these men and women who are here to hear from you. In Jesus' name, Amen.